So we'll start recording. So that should be good. Um, you'll find the audio quality of the lectures will improve uh, because you know I was just playing around with or playing around with it. Uh, I was sick when I made the first ones uh, in the spring, and that's another thing to mention. Uh, uh, ignore any specific dates in the videos because again they were made in the spring so there might be some spring specific stuff just remember you're in the summer and if it sounds like wait a minute that sounds like it's from the spring that's because it was that's when it was that's when they were all recorded uh, so there might be little bits here and there um, the nice thing about YouTube is you know if there's a pause or something you can just sort of fast forward through um, and uh, you know you can also choose the speed at which you're watching it as well. Although I talk pretty fast, so I don't know that I'd want to speed me up any more than you do. But you can slow me down as well, which might actually be very useful. Um, so okay, let's share files and da -da -da. so again, you don't want to worry about. Uh, I don't even click on it. So we want to learn. So what we want to so we want to get a context of what kind of stuff we'll be looking at. I've said these words like stars, planets, galaxies, and the universe, and you might have an idea of what they mean, but we want to define them and get a sense of how big they are relative to each other. And that's kind of our goal for today. Okay. So um, one of my favorite things about this course is that a lot of it is done in pictures, and uh, and we start today with pictures, and I. I want to, and before we get started, as we as we do this, we're going to use what we can see uh, to sort of dovetail into observations and what you know what is science, what it means to study science and to be a science, and uh, and the difficulty that will come in the course as we go through and talk about science, it'll seem like you'll wonder when is that going to end, and sort of the difficulty in terminology will peak around the. Um, you know, if, we, if these were normal weeks, it would peak around next week sometime, and then it drops off rapidly when we talk about the um, the rest of the universe, all right? Because we need this structure of science. We need to know how we know things to discuss what we know and what we see, all right? So let's sort of look at some pictures and get an idea of, uh, like I said before, of that scale of the universe, and we'll, we'll sort of take a quick little tour and uh, then we'll we'll watch a movie, and we'll uh, we'll end the day discussing some of the things we observe and see uh, in the universe. Okay, uh, we will be taking breaks, so uh, I'm I'm just sort of minding the clock. So at around 10:15 or 10:20, we'll we'll take our first break. Okay, so let's let's sort of go through and look at these slides and talk a, talk a little bit about the objects we'll be looking at. So you can see here that this is uh, this is an interesting picture as it shows sort of all of the scales that we look at. And you'll notice here, we start with the Earth. This is the planet Earth, our little pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it. Um, and uh, this picture gives us some idea, but it really doesn't give us any justice um, for for the true vastness of the of the universe. But if we look at our cosmic address, right? Where are we, right? So we're on this planet, and this planet Earth orbits a star, the sun, and you can see that the sun is here, and this is, these are all not to scale. The sun is much bigger than every object uh, in this uh, picture. And you can see there's our little planet Earth orbiting right there, and this star is one of many, many stars. We'll talk about that number in a little bit. Um, uh, many, many stars in our galaxy. So this Milky Way uh, a galaxy is a structure of, of thousands to trillions of stars. So that's, you know, to get an idea. And I want to start getting you familiar with reading scientific notation, but again, we won't do a lot of math. So thousands, so galaxies have thousands, that's 10 to the 3, to 10 to the 13th. Stars about that's that's not a minimum. Uh, so, ten to the third power is equal to one thousand. And this feels different than the independent in the spring. I wonder if there's a somehow messed with the line thickness. And ten to the thirteen. 
right? That's going to equal a one with one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen zeros after it. So that's so ten to the thirteen is about ten trillion. All right, in, in normal language. So you can see why we use scientific notation, right? Writing out these zeros, we're gonna have a lot of numbers, these you know, we'll, 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 we'll have these varying, varying scales and to compare them, the scientific notation makes sense uh, and lets us be more compact in our writing than writing out all these zeros. Now, I do want to sort of talk about the smaller scales just for a little bit, even though we won't be concentrating on it much. So if you go down a few zeros, right, if you have 0 0.0001, this would be 10 to the minus four. Does it think I'm writing a straight line here? This is, I swear Blackboard Collaborate has uh, changed since I started uh, doing it. So let me, let me do it, write that again. Point zero, 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 four. That's going to be equal to 10 to the minus four. All right, I have to figure that out because this the pencil was not like this in the spring. <laughs> um, so I may, I may just be stuck with it, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, uh, notice that this is not a negative number, first of all, it's 10 to the minus four power. And that tells you this was supposed to be a, hold on. That's a one, so sorry about that. Uh, so 0 0.0001 is equal to 10 to the minus four. And so that, that when we use scientific notation, this will give you, this number here will often indicate to you the scale, all right? And when we, when we talk about scientific numbers, we will, we'll sort of see this. So let's say we have 8.35 times 10, well, let's say to the fourth meters. Right, so this is the scale, this is what we've been talking about. This number here is the precision, that gives you information about the measurement you're making. And then this is supposed to be meters, and that's the unit, right? That's what type of quantity you're measuring. So scientific results are often described in these ways, using these, uh, using these three, uh, a scientific number has these three parts to it. So, looking here, our Galaxies also group together and form larger structures. They form groups and clusters and superclusters. And then those superclusters sort of fit in this, what we call larger cosmic web in, our uni in what we call our observable universe, all right? And hopefully we'll understand a little bit more about what those things mean uh, as we go through. Well, we ought to, that's the point of the course. So does everyone sort of see what I'm saying about numbers, scale, and, and what we're saying about these? these uh, varying scales right here? Any questions so far? I hope you have lots, <laughs> to be honest. So a lot of them might be, what are all these things? Sadly, we'll, we'll, we'll or well, we won't answer all of that today, but we'll, we'll get there. Each of these are entire chapters or sections of the class. So moving on, we start to see some of the objects. So a star is a large, you'll, you'll notice we use words like glowing, not burning, a ball of gas that generates heat and light through a process called nuclear fusion. So we don't use the word burning because burning will uh, imply a chemical process whereas uh, stars uh, are glowing, they emit light from a nuclear fusion process. Um, and we'll talk about what that is specifically. Uh, I'm a big fan of pictures of stars, and I want you to sort of look at the picture and think about how you would describe it. Because when you're doing activities and things like that in the class, often you'll look and see and, and talk about what you can see, right? When we talk about general relativity, we'll talk about what you can't see. So take a look here. You'll notice is, so I, I guess a question I would have for the class is, 
is the picture uniform? Is the star perfectly one color throughout? Take a look at it. Tell me what you see or what you like what features do you see? Different shades. Good. Dark spots. Good. Right. You'll notice that there's specks, like the, the spots aren't all the same. One side is, does look darker than the other. That's a good observation. So you'll notice there's more details. There's details to look at. And we'll talk about those details for stars. So it's, it looks like a perfect sphere. We'll see that stars usually have a lot of stuff, plasma burns, and features on the edges of them. All right? And we'll talk about the spherical nature of objects in the universe with mass, at least, um, uh, you know, as we go forward, as we understand uh, um, gravity. Okay. So stars are a big part of how we understand the universe, and I would say they're sort of, uh, they, they connect the small scale to the large scale, right? They're sort of the ever-present uh, objects, and there's very, and stars are all not uniform, they're not all the same. Uh, they have different temperatures, sizes, and we'll learn about the life and death of stars. Uh, planets um, are moderately large objects. They're relatively small compared to uh, stars, but they can be large relative to each other. Uh, planets can be rocky, like uh, Mars or the Earth, or they can be gaseous, like Jupiter or Uranus here that we can see. Um, and uh, planets are very interesting because uh, up until about, oh, I'd say 25 years ago, we only really knew about planets and could look at planets in our own solar system. So the number of known planets was about, uh, was eight, well, well, nine at the time. I put nine in quotation marks because Pluto was demoted because the number of planets started exploding up as we were able to discover planets outside the solar system. Uh, and so today we've looked at, at and cataloged thousands of planets outside of our solar system uh, that we have only the smallest amount of information about. We're actually looking at getting more and finer information about extrasolar planets is a big part of astronomy today. Uh, and hopefully Hopefully we'll have the good fortune and some interesting articles we published about that. They're usually published every couple months. Something makes the mainstream media about it. Um, but most of, the pro most of the planets we see are these gas giants, but we're starting to see uh, rock or rocky or Earth-like planets, that they call them. Um, and um, uh, even though, uh, you know, there's... There, even though it, you can sort of see that there's not really a possibility for life on these gaseous planets, or at least life as we know it, their moons offer possibilities for habitability. So that's something interesting to think about. And then, of course, uh, where, where a lot of the focus is, is on these Earth-like planets that are close enough to their star to support life. Um, and so that's a big question, right? Is there life out there in the universe? That's something we look to answer. Um, but... We, you know, what, when we look at stars, as we saw before, we're going to look to the closest star to us, which if you look outside, hopefully you don't look directly at it, but you should see the sun somewhere over there, you know, gaining altitude in the sky. Um, when we look at planets, the easiest planet for us to, to analyze is Earth. And a lot of, a lot of, uh, not, I would say students, but there's, there's a perception about NASA uh, you know, why does it study the Earth so much uh, when it should be studying the stars and outside? Well, the Earth is the closest planet to us, and it gives us the most accurate data. So we look, So the more we understand Earth, we actually, the more we understand features and other planets we see. Uh, and we can tell, we can, we can sort of deduce features, right? If we see something, you know, you know one, of the, one of the hallmarks of science that you'll see is that if we can do something in the lab on Earth, and we see the same results out in space, it means we don't need to actually go there to draw conclusions, right? And we'll see that, that's a, that, that, that actually we have very powerful tools that, for instance, let us see what elements are inside stars, what planets are made out of, the temperature, surface temperature of planets. Uh, we can determine that uh, without actually having to go. Uh, all sorts of things we can see uh, or we can determine. Uh, and it's actually pretty incredible. And almost all of it is determined through light. 
So, but there's other objects we'll see. Again, we talked about moons. So Ganymede is actually the largest moon in the solar system, and this orbits Jupiter. Uh, again, if a moon is large enough, you'll notice it looks like a planet, um, or at least it's spherical. Uh, you'll see we have these interesting irregular objects, asteroids and comets. We'll talk about the uh, differences between them, right, and how a comet's motion and its tail don't line up. That's a, a, a tantalizing possibility that we'll discuss. And we will talk about... Um, Again, there are all, like I said, there are all sorts of types of stars and systems, star systems. Uh, we will talk about how stars are formed, how galaxies facilitate star formation, uh, and how stars die, and gaseous nebulas are, are the objects that will help us understand that process. I like looking at these pictures, pictures of nebulas. What you're looking at here is large gas clouds, right? That uh, stars are either fr so that are uh, they can be star forming and be very large, like light years in size. These large gas clouds, but if it's but if it's a planetary nebula, it's usually localized. That's why they're called planetary nebula because they're localized in a small space, and they're the remnants of a dead star. Oh yes, question. Oh, they are beautiful to look at. Oh, I agree. I am a big fan of the pictures of this course. Um, I can kind of get lost in them, uh, but we're definitely looking at a stellar scale here. Okay, so now the next step up, when after we look at stars in the solar system, um, which is a big part of our course, is we look at galaxies. All right, so um, this is a picture of our closest galactic friend, Andromeda, which is in our local group. It's actually heading. Uh, uh, actually, I, I was two years ago. I would say it's heading right for us, but there's actually some debate as to the correct size of Andromeda and when it will get here, and if it really is heading exactly right for us. Uh, it's still accepted in astronomy that, that Andromeda and the Milky Way are destined to collide, but how that collision will play out is sort of a, a changing topic in the field. Um, but galaxies are deceptively huge. So a solar system, so in order for light to get to the edge of the solar system, it takes about probably four or five hours from light to get to, uh, from the center of the sun, it takes about eight minutes to get to Earth, and it can take a couple hours to get to the outer solar system. It takes light about 100,000 years to cross the galaxy, okay? So much bigger in scale, and it's hard to appreciate. Like I said, we're gonna watch a video, or I'm gonna give you the link to a video that you'll set up in YouTube uh, to watch um, to get through it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the, the, the scale, the, the scale here is mind boggling. And one of the things we actually do is it's, it's, it's interesting. I show a scale video today and we'll look at a scale video, uh, in week three when we start talking about stars. And once you have some context, it really blows your mind. It'll blow your mind a bit today, but without sort of the deeper context, you might be like, ah, so what? Um, but it, it should be, it should be okay. Now, let's see here. Um, so the universe is the sum total of everything we can observe. Uh, there is a universe beyond what we can observe. We can see things fading beyond our ability to, to observe them. And we can talk about the dynamics of the universe, uh, which we will at the end of the, you know, in six short weeks. Um, I want I do want to take this sort of pause step to remind you all that the semester creeps up on you a lot faster than you think in a normal semester, and it will be August before you know it. It's barely a month away. So, so keep on things and do the reading. Don't slack off on the course. Uh, it may seem like a great independent paradise, but, you know, it'll sneak up on you. So what we want to talk about to understand some of the scale of the, uh, of the universe is we talk about look-back time. Now, this won't make sense. There's the, you have to understand that look-back time is not equal is not equal to actual distance. Uh, 
okay? Um, so, <coughs> again, uh, where the universe is a dynamic object, it's always, its volume is increasing, the universe gets bigger every day. So we often talk about distances in how long ago light left an object, all right? So for instance, the moon, if you're looking at the moon, um, the, the, light it the time it takes for light to get from the moon to the earth is about one second. So you see the moon as it was one second ago. So it's one light, its distance is one light second in look back time. Uh, the sun is eight minutes away, all right? And Sirius, which is one of the closest stars, is eight years away. That means that you see this, the light from Sirius as it was eight years ago. And the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million, light, the light from it is 2.5 million uh, years old. So this is all related to the time it takes light to travel. And the main unit for that is called the light year. Because you'll see that even the closest star is light years away, all right? That's the years it takes light to travel. Now, why do we use light? Because the speed of light is a constant of the universe. We'll talk more about why that is as we get, as we, um, well, we'll never really answer why that is. We'll talk more about the consequences of it later in the course. But basically, the speed of light is often represented by C. It's equal to 186,000. miles per second, all right, or 300,000 kilometers per second, not per hour, but per second. Um, so light moves very fast, but it also moves at a constant speed. Not only, it, it moves, it's speed, you can't, how do I say this? So light speed is constant no matter how you measure it. So it doesn't matter whether you're standing on Earth or moving in a spaceship going half the speed of light. Uh, the light, the speed of light is always the same. And that's, it's, it's a universal sort, it's a universal, um, uh, you know, number that, uh, that describes the, the, uh, the uh, uh, rate at which light travels. Now, uh, what, we, what you'll understand as we talk about relativity, which we'll talk about a little later in the semester, um, it is impossible to go past the speed of light because going towards the speed of light as you get closer and closer uh, indicates that more and more energy is needed. And in fact, if you look at the math of special relativity, which is a very accurate, accurate model, uh, you know, uh, scientific model, it takes infinite energy to accelerate an object with mass at the speed of light. Uh, so that's why we say you can't go faster than the speed of light. Um, there's no real solutions that are past the speed of light. Um, so, but when we look at an object, any object, we look at it in the past. And the further away the object is, the further back in time we see. All right? So I hope that made some sense. Is there any questions on that? On look back time. Okay, so it's an important concept that will get us through. All right. So I, I want to sort of take a detour here. The reason why I'm doing the recordings is the recordings will look and seem exactly like this. So it'll almost be like I'm there. You'll see a slide, you'll see writing on it, and I'll talk about what you're seeing on the slide. I already have it recorded, so I figured, you know, I really, but you'll notice though that the, you know, I wanna get you all more comfortable asking questions and discussing stuff you find interesting, rather than spending all of our time just, just talking and you could do that, you know, on your own. Um, so, Da, da, da. Let's go forward. All right. So we can see an example here. This photo shows the Andromeda galaxy. This is what we would see today. And what we see now here 
is what the Andromeda galaxy looked like 2.5 million years ago. So we, we won't be able to see what Andromeda looks like today until 2.5 million years in the future. All right, that's when the light from today will get here. So it's sort of like looking at the universe is sort of like having a time machine that looks backward in time, right? We can see what things look like as they were. And this should help make sense. Uh-oh, uh, my, my computer tried to go off. But you may, you may have heard someone say at some point in your life, uh, the stars that we look at today may not even actually be there anymore. And what that means is, is that if you look at a star, so say, let me change the colors because blue is terrible. So let's say this is you, right? No, no, the multiverse theory applies to the total universe in totality. Uh, other galaxies are definitely part of our universe. So the universe is the sum totality of everything, right? A multiverse or parallel universe would be something that is parallel, uh, you know, like our universe, but not of it. Um, and, you know, they're one language you argue about everything there, you know, what constitutes everything there is. But the galaxies, that's a good question, actually. Uh, galaxies are, um, are, uh, are part of our universe. Uh, to get to multiverses, multiverses are very speculative at this point. No one's ever seen one. Uh, and the theories that predict them, they're competing, they're competing hypothesis. I use theory correctly there. They're competing hypothesis that predict uh, those, those types of objects. But I want to I wanna talk about this example with a star. So if you see the star here, and say this distance is 100 light years. All right? Call it a light year. So the light you're seeing today was emitted in 1920. All right? So you're seeing the star as it looked in 1920. And if it exploded, say, say it, it explodes in 1960. All right, so 1960 was um, 60 years. 60 years ago was it? 60? 60 years ago? Uh, that's that can't be right. The 40? Yeah, no. 1960 was holy moly. My stepmom is going to be 60 minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, 60 years ago. I, I I know the math keeps telling me it's 60 years ago. I can't believe it. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm going to be 40 next year, so I ought to believe it. <laughs> um, um, when I was born, 1960 was only, yeah, I guess it was 20 years in the past. <laughs> um, so, uh, so if say it exploded in 1960. So 1960 is still in our past, 60 years ago, but we won't see the light for another 40 years, right? So we'd have to wait to 2060 to see the star's explosion. All right, so that's that. I, I hope that gives you some clarity or some structure behind what it means by ah, oh, the star we see in the sky, it might not even be there. Okay. Um, so does that make sense? Is that is that making? I'm hoping it's making sense to people. A little, a little bit there. Okay, good. So with Andromeda, the the years are just a lot longer. So if something were to happen tomorrow in Andromeda, we wouldn't know about it. Uh, for another 2.5 million years. So certainly at, after the end of our lifetimes. Now what's interesting here is that we talk about, I talk about this, the speed of light, and it's sort of the, the misnomer and, um, so a shooting star isn't on real time. I'm not sure I know what you mean by, oh, a shooting star isn't. So a shooting star really is, because shooting stars aren't really stars. They're uh, objects, when you see a shooting star, that's an object igniting in the atmosphere. So uh, you're, you know, the, the, the deeper question actually is, is there such a thing as real time, right? Because even the shooting star you're seeing mi some microseconds in the past or nanoseconds in the past, even when you see each other, right? Usually I tell you to turn toward each other. You're only seeing your desk or whatever you're looking at as it was when the light left you. There's some delay time there. So I think the more interesting question is, what does it mean to be real time? What, it, what is the present, right? Um, you, can, you can drive yourself crazy thinking about that particular question. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, 
but um but that's 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 a, a fascinating question to answer and when we talk about how light experiences the universe things get even crazier um but uh but when you when you when you look here you know sort of getting i don't want to get too far off topic there um but but when you look at um these objects you know how we see them we see them as they were not as they are and uh i think deborah's point is interesting there about about real unreal time um and whether we're here or not so um it's about 10 20 so i'm going to say why don't we uh take a little break um let's come back at it's 10 20 now we'll come back at around 10 30 and we'll pick this up uh where we left off so when i take a break i usually go away from the computer um so i usually need to stand and stretch and things like that so no one really wants to see that um and uh and yeah so we'll be back at around 10 30 and we'll continue our lecture
Okie dokie. Let me get the video started. I have an old web camera, so this image will fix itself after a while. There we go. See, it, it figures itself out. Okay. So, all right. Hopefully you're all ready to keep on going. So, let's look here at our next um, our next instance here. We've talked about light years. So, in order to get a distance, sort of locally, again, look back time and actual distance are different concepts, but they can both be measured in light years. So let me tell you what I mean by that. If we, if we think of the, the universe, it sort of has this elliptical shape, right? So let's move it down. Okay. So it has a, sort of has this elliptical shape. Now, if we go we're going to make two straight lines to the edge. So this one's going to be in look back time or no, sorry, we need to change straight lines make every ruin everything. So this is just a rough picture. We're not trying to be so this is in look back time, and this is actual distance, distance. So the universe is about 13.7 times 10 to the ninth or billion years old. So that means in look back time, the very edge of the universe is when we talk about galaxies that are or objects that are you know if we're looking at something here and we say it's 12 billion years old we would say that okay that that the light took 12 billion years to get to us but that isn't the distance the radius of the universe is about 48 billion light years. Now, based on our previous discussion, I'm hoping you're saying, whoa, 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 that makes no sense. If the look back time is 14, 13.7 billion years, nothing should be older than 13.7 billion years. It's the farthest anything should be, be away. And in a static universe, you would be correct, right? But the universe is expanding. So that means that when we see something, Right when we see a distant galaxy, if we see it today as 12 billion uh, light years, that's how old the light was. We can tell how old the light was based on properties of the light, and we'll see that from when it emitted to reach Earth. The actual distance it is today is much bigger because the universe, like the surface of a balloon, has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's Oh, it's actually stretched this light, and we can see that in, in the way that it changes color. Uh, we can actually see that, that it's gotten bigger and bigger and stretched with the universe as uh, that time has gone by. So we have these two different distances. We're always going to talk about things in terms of look-back time. It's a little easier to handle. We'll very rarely, if ever, use the actual distance. Okay? But that being said, we can, we can look at both of these in terms of light years, right? We can say this was 12 billion light years away when it emitted from us. That's how, how the distance it covered originally. But if we were to send something back, like another signal, right? So say you wanted to send, uh, I'm just going to make the pencil here in dots. So you wanted to send another signal back. This, this other signal would have to cover a much greater distance. And in fact, this galaxy is so far away that we could never, you know, 
the signal we send would never reach would never reach it. It's receding from us faster than uh, the signal can get there. So uh, to understand how big a light year is, though, in terms of our distance, it's about or, or normal distances. One light year is about 10 trillion kilometers or six trillion miles. And again, a trillion. I'm going to cheat and look at the spelling is equal to 10 to the 12th. All right. So if you see a 10 to the 12th, that's a trillion. So a light year is really, really long. Okay. Now, again, you're notice, you, I want you to notice that when we do, when we look at distances, we're, uh, we're using these look back times. And you can tell because when we get to the beginning of the universe, it says we can't look beyond 14 billion light years. Okay? Because the light has not had enough time to reach us within the age of the universe. But again, this is all in terms of look back time. So we're going to want to be sure of what the context we're looking at. And you also don't want to jump down someone's throat when they say, ah, oh, the diameter of the universe is, um, you know, that we said the radius was 48 billion, so the, the diameter would be 90, 98 billion, you know, 98 or 96 billion light years. Uh, you know, both are right. You just have to understand the context in which you're talking about. Okay? So how big is the universe? That is a question we will be struggling with. And we'll see a video in, in a very short while that will give us some insight into how big the universe is. But one way to look at this is to think about how many stars are in the universe. And this is a good way of looking at sort of seeing numbers interpreted into scientific notation and to answering a sort of age-old question. Now, it's a very sort of famous saying that there are many stars in the sky as there are dry grains of sand on Earth. Uh, so I'm hoping that you're asking yourself, well, how do you know how many dry grains of sand are on Earth? <laughs> um, it's like a blanket. It keeps unfolding. I think, you know, I, th I like a balloon better because a blanket is finite, right? And the, the balloon could theoretically get bigger and bigger until it stretches and pops. Um, I think unfolding, unfolding is an interesting way to look at it. Um, I don't want to say, oh, well, that, that's, that's clearly not true. Because there's, when I imagine the universe, sometimes it is unfolding like a blanket. Um, but I think a more, a more useful physical, I would say a more useful physical model, not more correct, is thinking of it as, as the surface of a balloon. If you can imagine you blow up a balloon and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Or if you're prone to thinking about things like food, like I am, you can think of it like um, some, uh, if, you, if, you, if any of you ever made bread, right, you put it in and it expands and gets bigger and bigger. And like the raisins in the bread get farther and farther apart. So that's, that's a way that, that this expansion and, and getting bigger is a better way to think about it. Um, where folding gets complicated is that as you fold layers, things can get farther apart, but then can be refolded and get, you know, folding is, is fascinating. Uh, I think it's an interesting way to look at it, but it's, um, but you asked specifically if it would be correct. I think it would be more, like I said, more, you get more utility out of the expanding model. Um, interesting question though. Interesting question. Um, so the Milky Way is, is one of about 100 billion galaxies in our observable universe. And we can often see from the light, we can, we, can, we can see from the light and the dynamics of the galaxy and the intensity, we can get an idea of how many stars are in all those 100 billion galaxies. So it sort of makes sense we can get 10 to the 22 stars, but how would you get as many grains, how would you get uh, all the grains of sand on Earth? So right now I'm hoping that that seems like a ridiculous statement. And that there's no way to possibly count that. And what I'm hoping is that in the next five minutes, or 10 minutes, or however long it takes, uh, to describe the process, you will be convinced that you can't count the individual grains of sand on Earth, but you can get a pretty good idea. OK? Uh, so this is, this is what I call a low complexity, high tedium problem. All right? It's not hard to do, but it would take a long time. And it's, and it's definitely doable. So the first thing I want to ask you, so the first question is, and I, is it reasonable to think that you could calculate 
hold on. Actually, you know what? I'm going to text met, type type this in text. Is it reasonable that you could calculate the area of all the sandy beaches? On Earth, so is it reasonable that this could be calculated? That's my first question. Let me move, move, move it. Right? You could use Google Earth, and you could probably, you know, hire a bunch of people in academia we call graduate students to uh, to actually do that. Right? Does this seem? Re I'm hoping this seems reasonable that you could do. It would take a while, but it's it's definitely doable. You could, you could set 100 graduate students to get this done in a couple months. They may be even faster if they have an algorithm for it. You can certainly look up some of it by looking at coastlines and writing programs. There's a, probably a few creative ways to do it. OK? So, so does that seem reasonable? I'm hoping it seems reasonable. Let me know if it seems reasonable. I'll try and convince you if it doesn't seem reasonable. I hope I've, I've convinced you it seems reasonable. What do you think? I'm hoping everyone's just nodding, but I'm going to go with yes. No one has objected, so I'm going to go with that. So now the next thing is, is once these graduate students, our intrepid graduate students, have calculated that from the comfort of their own home, we now need to do something dangerous, such as go outside and send a graduate student to some of our graduate students around the world with beaches to measure the average depth. Well, we're, we're getting, you're on the right idea, uh, uh, Nisha. You're in the right idea. Um, but the next thing we need to do is get them to get sticks to measure the depth of all of these beaches. Now, this gets a little expensive, uh, but if we can get graduate students or people that are local to measure this depth, get a stick, they could probably figure that out pretty easily. Again, beaches aren't all that deep. Uh, or at least the dry sand parts are. You get to wet sand pretty quickly. So measure the depth of um, depth of the beaches. So now what this effectively gives you is not the area, right, but the volume of dry sand. on Earth. okay? So we'll be very mathematical, and we'll call that we'll call that uh, v. Or hold on, we'll be very fancy here, and we'll call that v dry sand earth. Okay, and so now what we do is we pick our least favorite graduate student. All right, and there's always one, and we make our least favorite graduate student take a really small cube. Let's say a cube that's about, oh, I don't know, a little tiny cube that's about a millimeter across. We don't want to make them suffer too much. But a little tiny cube that's a millimeter on all dimensions. And we make this, this least of all graduate students, we make him count the number of grains of sand to completely fill up this cube. All right? So we make him fill up that cube, and that graduate student then has the, uh, yeah, I know, you have to be the worst graduate student, but you could, you could do it, right? A millimeter is very small, very small. Look, if you get a, if you, get a uh, um, you know, it's not a large volume. It's definitely countable. Um, so if you, if you look at that, you then get the, uh, all the emails are starting to go through. You get the number. Hold on, this has to stop. I dislike that, that it, it just keeps going. Um, that's the email, that is. Uh, so you get the number, little n, in the cube. And then you also have the volume of the dry sand in the cube, right? So now, all you have to do is get the number of dry grains of sand, that we'll call that big N, 
right? So that will be equal to um, the big volume we calculated over the little volume we calculated, right? So that's uh, dry sand earth. over uh, dry sand cube times that little n. And this will give us big N. So this will give us an order of magnitude, right? And when you do this calculation, you get about 10 to the 22 grains of sand. Of sand. I'm gonna see if there's settings here. Uh, the pencil's just really annoying me. It used to be much more wieldy uh, in the spring. I guess they updated Blackboard to make it more annoying. Um, so, so yeah, so we can get that and we can see that this comparison is actually true. So that, that saying you've heard uh, that there's many stars, there's many grains of sand, or at least dry sand, as there are stars in the universe, is true. And it's, 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 a problem that is tractable, all right? So you could think of as this kid is throwing these uh, the sand around, you can think of them each as stars, all right? Okay. Um, so let us continue on. So the history of the universe, uh, how did we come to be, will be a big question. We're going to study that, but one thing you should always ask when you're when you're going through this and as you go through the videos, and what I'm hoping our discussion will, what, that as you ask questions, as you read your book and follow the, the video lectures, is how do we know this? And I'm really, it's my hope that that will be the, the main topic of almost all of our um, discussions, right? How do we know something? How do we know what we know? All right, so we, we, you, you'll notice a lot of this comes from pictures. Uh, but one of the first videos I'm going to have us watch is I saw something on um, how astronomy pictures are put together. And I think it'll answer a lot of uh, pictures because sometimes you'll see things that say FC or false colors or artist rendition. And I found a good video the other day um, that hopefully uh, may, at some point next week we'll look at how we, uh, when we talk about light, when we're on that chapter, uh, we'll talk about, uh, we'll look at that video and discuss it. Uh, it's it's quite good. Um, it's it's quite interesting. I have to find it again though, unfortunately. But we can see here um, we have a we we when we look at where we came from and how did the universe come to be, it comes from a scientific model called the Big Bang theory and Big Bang cosmology. And there's a lot of words in science that have meanings that are different than collo colloquially. So a theory in science is a well thought out and experimentally testified set of ideas, right? It's not just an idea and that, it's not just a thought, a thought, a thought process. Uh, and that can confuse a lot of people and lead a lot of people down astray. Uh, I often hear things like, well, Einstein's theory of relativity is just a theory, it's not real. Einstein's theory explains a lot more than Newton's laws of motion. Um, but into the development of physics from the natural sciences and philosophy and for, for sort of historical reasons and as we move forward, we don't really call things laws anymore. Uh, and laws are more, laws are more based on uh, empirical, um, uh, empirical um, observations and they lack, they come from a time when you could just say, I see this, this is what, I, what it is. Uh, what Newton did is he created the theoretical model right? So that there's models and experiments, and you could use models to predict things that you didn't see in experiments. And that sort of, that sort of got everything, you know, you know, into what we call sort of modern physics in its, in, a, in its, in its current state. Um, so our theory, our working theory of the universe is this big bang model, all right? And this cube sort of shows how as the universe expands and gets bigger, it, you know, objects become farther apart. And there are observations we'll talk about later in the semester that will give us evidence for thinking this, okay? Um, so we'll also talk about star recycling in galaxies. We'll talk about that galaxies actually facilitate star birth and uh, death. And then we'll look at, on Earth, 
you know, by the, you know, on, on stars, the star cycle allow the last planets to form. And then, well, when you start talking about life, you get more into biology. And uh, I am, if I could wear a sign, one of the signs, many signs I wear around my neck is I'm not a biologist. Uh, so we're going to skip this part. And, um, and I want to talk, I want to actually um, watch our video and then we'll talk about Spaceship Earth because I give it, giving it, seeing it uh, looks, looks okay. So I'm going to um, give you the link and some instructions. So let's go here. Powers of 10. I always like the 1970s one. So that's the one we'll do. All right, let me. So the video is about nine minutes. So click on the link there and get to the video. And so at about, um, it's 10.52 now. I'm going to start the video and watch it. And um, cause I, I, I've seen it about 20 times, but I need a refresher as well. Uh, so let's watch the video and discuss it. And we'll meet back here in about 11 minutes. So at about 4 after 11, we'll, we'll come back. I'll turn my sound back on, and we'll uh, talk about the video. OK? So I'll see you all in 10 minutes. Click that link and watch the video.
Okie dokie. All right. So I like that video from the 70s, uh, mainly because um, you're going to see how much things have changed. And 1977 was just a little over 40 years ago. And you're going to see that our knowledge has increased a lot. Uh, I'm glad you found it interesting. Um, our knowledge on the short end of the spectrum has gotten, well, a little, you know, quarks are an interesting thing to discuss, but kind of beyond the scope of the course. Uh, but as far as going outwards, we can go much farther out than the 1977 video. And a lot of the things we know about the universe, um, we didn't know in 1977. So what you're going to see is that a lot of the stuff we talk about is um, is really rather new science. And that's a, the exciting thing about astronomy and why I think it's a great course to take as part of your college experience is because it's a science where results are published almost weekly and new things are happening. It's a developing science. And, uh, you know, you'll be able to get a lot of appreciation and depth, you know, going forward. You know, it's very enriching for the rest of your life. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff there. Um, so, um, bah, 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 bah. I, I watched that, I watched that for the first time when I was in, in elementary school. Yeah, no, my, my science high school teacher showed it to me too. Um, so was there a question? I missed, I saw a hand up. I just wanted to be sure I didn't, I don't miss anybody. Uh, Jana, was your hand up? It has you down there with a hand up. Okay. Um, just chime in if you want. No problem. Um, but yeah, no, I've seen that. I've seen that that video a few times myself too. Um, and And what you would call it. Um, so, sorry, uh, all sorts of weird stuff going on today. Um, so, um, so right. Uh, so yeah. So that. Uh, so from the seventies, you'll be able to see where we've gone as we go through the course, and it's really fascinating because um, it's 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 sometimes it's. Sometimes it's easy to lose track. You're going to see we're going to talk about uh, the models of science. Uh, one of the things you'll see in the – oh, Jesus. One of the things you'll see in the um, – as, as our lectures go forward is we'll start talking about the Earth being at the center of the universe as a scientific theory, which it is. It's incorrect, but it is a theory with predictions, uh, some of which you can you can get, and you'll understand why – the, you know, the, the actual measurement differences between an Earth-centered versus solar, you know, versus sun-centered theory for the solar system, at least. But our ideas of the universe have grown rapidly since 1920, um, and even more rapidly since 1990. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's sometimes easy to think that everything you were learning is really old stuff, but I'd say, I, I, I mean... I'd say 75% at least, maybe upwards of 85 to 90, is all stuff from 1920 forward. Um, and it's amazing the things we've been able to understand since then. Um, so, or, or is 100 years old or less. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so that, that, I like to use that to give you the scale of the universe. Some things if you want to watch the video again to notice is that on the left and right sides, you have the numbers. It had the scientific notation, I believe, on the right side and the actual uh, regular number on the uh, left-hand side. So you can look at that again and get, get some more interpretive stuff through that. Um, I think, uh, oh no, right, it's the Spaceship Earth. So now, now that we've sort of seen where we, you know, you know, the scales of the universe from, from that uh, picture, we want to talk about one of the questions I'd like students to think about on the first day in particular is to consider if we are moving, right? Or if we're ever still, if we can ever be still, okay? Uh, and when you think about it, we're in a, on a planet that is rotating, right? 
uh, and that planet is rotating on its axis and moving around the sun, that stun, star is moving in a galaxy, and that galaxy is moving away from its local partners and the universe is expanding. So in some ways, we're moving incredibly fast relative to some blank space, you know, some faraway spot uh, in the universe. But yet, we can sit here quite calmly and convince ourselves in some sense that we're still. So let's get a sense of how it is we are moving through the universe, all right? So you'll notice it just gives it away immediately. This is contrary to our perception. We are not sitting still, although it is not incorrect to describe ourselves at rest. Uh, rest is a good word. I like the word rest. Uh, so we are moving in several ways and with the Earth itself in several ways. And you'll notice the speeds can be very, very fast. So the Earth rotates around its axis once every day. And the Earth is about 25,000-ish miles in circumference at its biggest point. So you'll notice that the speeds, these are the tangential speeds, are not the same along different points on the sphere uh, from the rotation axis, all right? So you'll notice at the equator, you're moving at a whopping 1,670 kilometers per hour, but if you were to stand at the axis of rotation, you wouldn't be moving at all, right? But these speeds rapidly increase as you go down. Now, you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, that seems weird. Your rotational speed, your angular speed, is going to be the same no matter where you are on Earth. So, and that will dictate your, you know, that plus the gravity of the Earth will dictate you sort of feeling on the Earth and not, not feeling that motion. So you won't actually, and because the distances are so great compared to you, you won't really feel an acceleration uh, going from one to the other because they change so small of the amount of time that it would take to get there. Um, so, but you'll notice we're spinning very quickly, all right? Now, you'll notice that, uh, hold on. So we know that the Earth orbits around the sun. Uh, ah, here, it's, here, here it goes. So the Earth takes one year to orbit the sun at an average speed of 107,000 kilometers per hour. So that is really far, and this can be figured out from looking at the distance, the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. Now, I want to do a little sidebar here. You'll notice they introduced this one AU. So this AU is, the, the, is called the astronomical unit, all right? That's an important quantity. Almost all of our distances can be related to this astronomical unit or based on it, and it's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Now, you might be wondering, well, wait a minute. Why is it Earth-centric? Well... Tell me who you know that lives on another planet. I bet the answer is nobody. So we all live here, so we use that distance. And all of our distance observatories are relatively close to the Earth. Uh, so all of, our, all of our base positioning comes from this segment. Uh, and we'll, uh, you'll, we'll see that as we go forward, what, the importance of this distance. Now, this distance is about 93 million miles, um, or about 150 million kilometers, which it says there. Um, and... Uh, so you'll so you can use these distances to sort of figure out and derive how fast the Earth is moving around the Sun, and that is pretty whopping fast. Think about this: your most cars only move at about 150 kilometers an hour. Maybe they top out at 200 kilometers an hour. They're going really fast, and the Sun is orbiting at 107,000 kilometers per hour. So that is darned fast. Uh, and we can look at the um, we can do the same thing and see that our sun will move randomly or our sun or our sun moves randomly relative to other stars in our local neighborhood. Uh, the typical relative speeds are about 70,000 kilometers per hour. That's how fast we see moving things moving past us. And if we do the same thing looking at our, our orbital calculation of how long it takes the sun to go around the Milky Way, which is about 230 million years, we get that the sun is moving at around 800,000 kilometers per hour. So you are a very fast moving object, but the thing you'll notice here is that the word you'll, you'll often see is relative. It's relative to what? If you're standing outside the galaxy watching you move, you're moving very fast, but we're all on Earth moving around our sun, which is so our motion relative to our sun is much slower than our motion relative to other stars around our uh, around our galaxy. So that that's that that word will come up a few more times and we'll you know we'll we'll sort of start to understand that more. 
And then, um, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, that's some dark matter stuff. But now we can see here that the galaxies within the universe are moving apart fairly quickly. Um, I'm trying to see if we can look at, look at something here. This is a local raisin. This is using the bread bake model, but it's not giving us a number. Um, but the universe is also expanding, adding, adding another uh, dynamic uh, variable speed to uh, our movement. So overall, we're moving really, really fast in this expanding universe. Uh, let me see if it says here, our galaxy moves relative to the local group at another 300,000 kilometers per hour. Um, and you add it all up, it gets, uh, the universe expands, the more distant objects will actually be receding from us at speeds close to the speed of light. Uh, and actually, to tell you the truth, some of them exceed the speed of light. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Professor Toland, you just said nothing moves faster than the speed of light, and I've heard that before. Two objects can move away from each other faster than the speed of light. If what, 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 what that means, if they're doing that, that means that they're no longer causally connected. That means that the information, all the information that that's shared with them is all they'll ever see. That means in the future, you, you, you'll you see stuff from the past, but if you sent a future signal to that galaxy, it would never get there. Uh, ever, 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 ever. So, so it's sort of an interesting question and one of the first questions to really sort of change your perspective. And you're going to find that when we talk about objects in the universe and the universe itself, it will often be required for us to change perspective, and frequently the perspective we have is almost unvisualizable. We almost need to change perspective just to, not to give us insight, or, or the insight that changing perspective will give us is that how we experience space and even time is not the correct explanation for the universe, or for our experiments that describe the universe. Uh, okay, so that's good. So what I want to do now is um, take our, our second, our, our sort of a bigger break. Um, so we, we took a short break before. So let's give us, it's 11.17 now. Um, let's come back at uh, 11.35, uh, 11.40, and we'll finish out the lecture. Um, with the, uh, the other thing. So I'll leave this up for now, and uh, I'll be back then. And I'm just going to manage some emails and things like that, and, uh, and I'll be back at around 11, 11.35, and we'll get started a, a little then or a little after, okay? All right.
Okie dokie. I am back. Right. I just want to get the attendance very quickly. Right. I'll update it if needed, but I usually just take a picture of the thing on the side to get the attendance, so that should be okay. Um, all right, 12, 13, 14. That's no, not bad. Uh, okay, so we want to load and start our next chapter. So we should do that. All right. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to we want to switch over and we want to start sort of building up what is a science and and, and the sciences and we'll do that over the next couple lectures uh, but we have to start with what we can see because before we had fancy machinery and and you know mathematics was developed uh, the the basic you know a basic part of science is what can you see and what can you learn from what you observe uh, so we want to look at patterns in the night sky and patterns in the sky and see how the things we observe tell us about the world around us. Okay? So let's take a look at what the universe looks like from Earth with our naked eye because that was the first um, – that was the um, – uh, Um, that would be, uh, whatchamacallit, um, <coughs> hold on, I need to, I need to take, I need to do something very quickly, uh, otherwise I'm going to have students in my other class, there was a scheduling snafu for today, so I just need one second, and then I will be back, and we'll cover the rest of it, it should only take me about three minutes, so, hold on, sorry for that, if you, if you came back. Um.
I'm really sorry about that, everybody. It's It's been a little crazy. That Monday, Wednesday thing led to some massive misschedulings on my part. Uh, mistake on your syllabus. I made a whole bunch of plans and I, I was under a mistaken impression about times for a while. So it's created, and it's my fault, it's nobody's fault but my own, but it's a uh, it's made today a lot more chaotic than one would expect. So I had to, uh, I was getting several emails. Um, so I had to, uh, I had to make that known. Okay. So. Um, so, la da 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 da. Um, Okay, so what does the universe look like from Earth? Okay, so we want to see what we can, what, what objects we can see and how they behave. And so with the naked eye, we can see the Milky Way galaxy, and we can see all of these stars in the background, and we can see about 2,000 stars as well as the Milky Way. And these all sort of behave the same way as they rotate through the night sky. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, so it's essentially when you look at the, at the night sky and you look at the stars versus the planets, we'll talk about patterns, but you'll notice that there's, uh, there's basically 2000 objects plus this giant splotch, uh, that move in a very distinct and predictable way. And there are five objects that don't, and we call those five objects planets. That's how planets were originally seen as different than stars. Uh, but we'll get there. Let's talk about things we see in the night sky. So constellations are patterns people see. I've got to be honest, I'm not terribly good at seeing them. I mean, I kind of guess Orion looks has a belt, and a lot of people say this looks like a person. Um, they're trying to convince you that these are other things. I, you know, the Big Dipper, the actual one that looks like a, a cup, is the only one that, that's ever made sense to me. But there are 88 official constellations in that fill the sky. Um, Professor Sheffield tried to convince me that um, there was a whale constellation. It looked like a big square. I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't see it. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't get much from it. But you know, there you go. Um, so uh, a lot of people really like the constellations. I'm unfortunately probably not your, your best constellation person. Uh, but there are patterns, and as you, get, as you see more and, and use obstacle instruments like a, a binoculars or a telescope to let more light in, uh, the patterns start to disappear because more stars become visible. So fun fact, with your naked eye, 2,000 stars are visible, but if you put, um, uh, if you just get a, a, a decent pair of binoculars, you can up the number of stars you see to about 100,000. And so that's a huge increase in what you can see, and that's because binoculars collect more light than your eyes, uh, so they can see the dimmer stars that you can't see with your eyes. Um, but getting back to our lecture here, the celestial sphere is sort of this tool that helps us look at how things like the stars and the sun and the moon move relative to the Earth. And you'll notice that the Earth here is at the center. So the celestial sphere is a tool in which the, set, the Earth is sort of put at the center of the universe, if you will. And again, that conclusion is based on measurements. And think about it. If you had two, imagine you had 2,000 data points or 2,005 data points. 2,000 of them fit your model perfectly, and five didn't. So you, most of you probably would throw those five out, and that, that gets you to an Earth-centric model. Uh, we'll see what the objections were to a sun-centered model as we go forward. So that's a little bit more, um, you know, you can see different constellations from different parts of the Earth, whether you're in the uh, north, nor northern or southern hemisphere. Um, and all the stars sort of appear, oh, hold on, I think, uh, all the stars sort of appear in the same distance away, but they're actually, you know, they appear on this uh, uh, celestial sphere, but they are all actually different distances away. Uh, and again, it took, took the invention of the telescope, or at least the application of the telescope to astronomy to, um, to, 
to really resolve that the stars were different distances away. Uh, and when we look at the Milky Way, this was just an unknown object at first before individual stars could be resolved with a telescope. Uh, but it's this band of light, and what we're actually looking at, it's our view into the plane of the galaxy. All right, so this is us looking at our own home galaxy uh, in the sky. That's, that's what the Milky Way is. And we don't see a lot of it. A lot of it looks dark because dust scatters visible light. Uh, we'll actually learn about the electromagnetic spectrum, and we will see that with modern tools, we can observe a lot of details about uh, our Milky Way and the disk. Um, so going through, I like this slide because there's something we can see. Uh, so this dot here, it says it's our location in the, in the galaxy of our solar system. But I want you to note that uh, every this dot likely represents far more than every star we can see with our naked eye. So every star we can see with our naked eye very likely would fit into less than a pixel here of this, uh, of this yellow dot. So that should give you an idea of the immense and vast size of the galaxy compared to what we experience in the galaxy. We only see a very, very small fraction. And again, with modified optics, we can see more. Okay, but the our sun, this picture doesn't do justice just how small we are in the uh, galaxy. All right, um, so positions in the sky, of course, can be bro can be broken down into two angles uh, by the um, sort of your uh, your altitude along the meridian line gives you position here, and then you can use the horizontal line as well. You can start to get longitude and latitude. I don't like to cover that a lot, but you can, the basic point of this slide is that you can quantify the positions in the, uh, in the night sky by breaking it up into a hemisphere. And this is also should sort of indicate something you'll see going forward or we'll see going forward, which is that it was pretty much known that the earth was round for a very, very long time. We're talking thousands of years, not a few hundred. Um, and so if you co co uh, compose these horizontal and meridian lines, you get an XY coordinate that is in the shape of this hemisphere. And the zenith is the point directly overhead. Um, so because of this, we measure the side, we measure angular separation of objects in the sky. So when we look at a constellation, we look at the angular separation between the two stars. The moon, for a good reference, takes about a half a degree in the night sky. Uh, again, this is just to give you an idea of how we measure things. It's not meant to, you know, you're not going to have to do calculations. And minutes can broke, or degrees can be broken up into minutes and seconds. And you'll notice that the same base 60 that has been used for tens of thousands of years, well, not tens of thousands, but thousands of years since the times of ancient Babylon, are, um, are still pretty much in use today. So, Going forward, um, we want to get to the next thing we can see, angular size versus physical size. So what I was talking about, about the stars themselves move very regularly in these circular patterns, all right? So stars will rise and set. And you can figure out the direction to the North Pole by looking at the concentric circle where it gets the smallest here. You can see, you can, here you can see the, the full circle. And you can see these circles get bigger and bigger. And as you get the circle gets bigger, the stars will rise and set. And you can use this to point to uh, true north. OK? So <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So we, we're still doing celestial sphere stuff. Uh, don't really want to talk about that much more. Um, so why do constellations we see depend on latitude and time of year? Well, the Earth is a sphere. You know, you can see if you're standing here on the Earth, you can't see stuff from the other side, right? And we break up the Earth itself using latitude and longitude. But again, that's all positioning. Uh, we want to talk about more about what we observe. Um, the sky will vary with latitude, but not longitude. 
And I don't cover most of this because it's Constellation stuff. Uh, what I want to talk about is the day, all right? So the special topic of how long is a day. So the solar day, so there's a difference between the sun getting to its position, its original position, that is equal to 24 hours, and then there's the earth to get back to its same position, which is 23 hours and 56 minutes. So this is the sidereal day. So they're slightly off from each other. Um, I need an extra little bit to get the sun back to its origin point. So this creates some interesting things like, um, you know, leap seconds that, that, are, that are added and tacked on every once in a while. You'll find if you study calendars, things can get weird. Um, part of that is that the Earth's year is actually a quarter day longer than 365.24 days. So we add in that leap year, but then these small corrections can add up over time. And I think we actually skip a leap year every the, there's there's weird reasons to skip leap years uh, based on the accumulation of those four minutes uh, adding up. Uh, so now we want to we want to think about why about some of the things we observe. One of the main thing we we observe as people on Earth is the changing of the seasons, and that has been a, a, a large observing and predicting the changing of the seasons has been a large part of cultures all over the world. Um, and so now what we want to look at is why those seasons change. So it's tempting to think that those seasons change because of the distance between the Earth and uh, the Sun. But let me ask you this question to think about that. What it's right now where we're starting, there are, it's our summer solstice, right? So it's the longest day of the year. Is it the longest day of the year is in uh, Australia as well, or is it different? Think about that. Turn that off. Right, it's different and false. The Earth is the Earth actually. Um, in the northern hemisphere, at least, the Earth is actually uh, uh, closer to the um, sun during uh, winter, I think. I know the answer, the correct answer is, is false, right? But we note that it's different and that in Australia, it's actually the winter solstice. So we know that there's two seasons at the same time. It's winter in one part of the Earth and it's summer in another part. So that means it can't be the absolute distance between the Earth and the Sun. And in fact, because the Earth is a nearly circular orbit, the distance plays very a very small role, and, and almost a negligible role. The real reason for the season is the tilt of the Earth. All right? So the Earth tilts about 23.5 degrees, which we can see here. And as you rotate around, you'll notice at different points that Earth, that tilt leads to different parts of the Earth getting different amounts of sunlight. Now, one of the real drawbacks to doing this course online is that the uh, little applets that illustrate lots of things do not work. So uh, you can YouTube it if you want. Um, try and look for YouTube or look for your own, you know, resource that shows this. But the um, but you'll you, you can notice from the picture that you know the sun sort of you know as the as this tilt moves. If you get if you get a pencil, right? Get a pen and tilt it with the Earth. If you can imagine the sphere as you move it around, you'll notice that different parts are facing the sun at different times through the circle as it goes around. That means those parts are getting more sunlight than, than others. And, uh, and that explains, and if, you have, if, you're at a, if you're at a position where the tilt gives you more sunlight, that's summer. Less sunlight is winter. All right, so the seasons, which are important to predict, depend completely on that tilt of the Earth. And see, these are the, the applets I was talking about. You can sort of see, as if you'd see this move around, it would show you sort of what it looks like with a stationary Earth with the sun moving. You can see the different parts illuminated. But again, it doesn't work so well here. The axis tilt is changing the year. Now, 
the sun's altitude, one of the ways we can see the seasons changing is that the sun's altitude will also change with the seasons. And this is sort of a yearly portrait, a portrait over the year of the sun. And we can see that at a certain time in the morning in summer, the sun's altitude is higher. So at like 9 a.m. would be higher during the summer than at winter, okay? And so we can actually visualize and see, looking at the sun's position over time, uh, that we're getting less direct sunlight as the seasons uh, progress. Okay, does that make sense? Is there any questions about that? I wanna be sure that, that, that we're all at least of the same page here. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. We've seen the real reason for the seasons. Remember, it's axis tilt. That will almost assuredly come up on a quiz. Um, so again, I sort of answered this question already, but the, uh, the variance is small. It only changes by about 3%. So the, um, and we're actually looking here at, at Pluto, I believe. I don't think that's the Earth. Um, so for uh, so for uh, objects, oh, that's why we're saying Pluto. So not all planets have as circular of an orbit as um, the Earth. Even though they're showing us Pluto, which is not a planet, had to be demoted as our number of planets grew. I said that earlier. I don't know that I finished that thought, but I didn't. Uh, that's why Pluto had to be demoted, because once we had thousands of hundreds and then thousands of planets, uh, more specific criteria had to be established. And in fact, in our own solar system, if we didn't demote Pluto, there'd be probably 25 planets. Um, so it had to go. Uh, so, um, so you don't need to go as far as Pluto to get a more extreme orbit. Mars has a much more elliptical orbit than uh, the Earth. And I'll show, I, wanna, I want you to be able to visualize what I mean by that. So the Earth's orbit is nearly circular. So it looks somewhat like this. A slight ellipse, but not much. Mars's orbit is more like this. All right. If you, I, I hope you can see it. It's a lot more elliptical, which means that 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 distance will play a role, because things orbit in ellipses around what we call a focus or a foci. So Mars will spend a lot of time. The the uh, one hemisphere seasons are more extreme than another's in Mars, just by having that. Um, that distance. So distance can play a role, it's just that on Earth it doesn't because of our uh, nearly circular orbit. Okay, And Pluto again is an extreme example as well. It has a very elliptical orbit. Um, so we define special uh, uh, four special points, our summer solstice, which is actually today I think or yesterday. We're within, it's either today or we're within a few days of it. It might have been the 21st. Um, so we're, we're, right, we're right there as far as that goes. Um, the winter solstice, of course, will be in December. And we have our spring and fall equinoxes in which we get about the uh, equal amount of sunlight. So those are four important positions to remember. Uh, if you're going to remember positions, those are what you want to remember. Um, so, so we can recognize paths on equinoxes and solstices. You know, we can look at the smallest and the greatest path and sort of get halfway in between them on the equinoxes and it'll go back and forth, all right, when they look at it. And again, you'd have to look at the sun over the course of a year, right? You're not gonna get this data over a day. But if you think about it, when you're hunting and gathering and looking at things, well, all you really have to do is make these observations and see what you can see. Someone must have thought, huh, that's weird that it changes. I wonder how it changes. You take data and then you start to see, you start to be able to predict these things based on the sun's position. Now, this is one of those slides I've always thought was super cool. I even review it for quite a bit in the, in the next, in the next uh, uh, lecture. But uh, when I was a kid, I always wondered what the 24-hour day looks like. So we talk about days getting longer and shorter in summer and winter, but in the extreme, um, you know, north and south in the Arctic and the Antarctic, they actually have months long days and months long nights, right? So the sun, because it's a, there's an angle, 
Uh, for instance, right now, the sun won't set in the Arctic. And in fact, uh, I believe this is in Alaska somewhere. And you can see that each of these slips represents the sun in during an hour of the day. And there's 24 of them. And you'll notice that the sun almost sets but then doesn't quite, it keeps, it keeps uh, rising uh, again, and then it'll come back to the position and almost set, but then not quite set. Uh, now, 24 hour dark is not as interesting, it's just dark all the time, right? <laughs> um, but you can see this 24 hour day, and it's pretty fascinating, I think. Uh, so take a look at it, there's 24 strips, this is what a, a 24 hour day looks like. Um, and again, you can imagine it's, uh, you know, at midnight, it looks like sunset and you might get some, it might let, you know, start to look like night a little bit, but then that sun will pop right back up. Okay. So the, so now, interestingly, the earth rotation can be complicated. And so while the Earth is spinning on its axis, it also has a secondary motion that's sort of like a top called precession. And that is that the Earth's axis actually changes and goes back and forth between extremes. And so this has a period as well. So you'll notice that in the year 15,000, the North Star will, not, will very clearly no longer be the North Star and will be pointing to this star Vega as the North Star. And uh, so although the axis seemed fixed on our time scales, it actually processes over about 26,000 years. Um, so the axis processes like a spinning top. So it's on our time scale, it seems constant. And even over the course of human civilization, which writing is, if you're being really nice, if you're being really gracious, is about 6,000 years old. So even in that sense, we've only gone a little bit towards our north and south uh, poles. And we've only been really looking at astronomy with written records, you know, reliable written records for about 2,000 years, uh, maybe 2,800 years. So the North Star has been the North Star for a very small fraction of this precession cycle. So, so it's long, but it's there. And in the year 15,000, you know, it'll look different. And of course, over long enough times, different stars will be moving very randomly and the sky will look very different than it does today. Okay, so now we sort of get to, this is the interesting thing, we'll, we'll talk about the moon and then review it, but we want to talk about our constant companions, sort of the two big objects we see are the moon and the sun, and how do we see them? We sort of talked about how we see the sun, it's angled, it's 23 degree, um, this 23 degree uh, angle. Uh, but the moon we see uh, as an object that orbits the earth every uh, 27.3 days. Uh, now lunar phases are a consequence of this orbit and the, the fact that the earth and the moon are tidally locked. What that means is that the same face of the moon is always facing the earth. The moon does rotate on its axis but the same, but the lunar day is as long as the lunar year. So that's why we only see the same side of the uh, moon. Now, as we go through, we'll notice that as we look in the, that the moon in the sky, the moon doesn't look the same all the time. And it's because of that, again, um, it's because of the fact that the earth or the moon rotates around the earth and that it's facing us in the same, the same face always faces the, uh, uh, the earth that we see these different phases. Uh, so in a new moon, for instance, if you look here on the, I don't have it selected. If you look at a new moon, you'll notice that, that uh, all the light is hitting what we traditionally refer to as the dark side of the moon, the side that doesn't face earth. And so when we look at the moon, there's no light hitting it and this is kind of interesting to see. If light doesn't hit something or scatter off of something, we can't see it. So that's why when we look at the sky, we don't see the moon. You have to be able to, um, you know, there, there are ways to see it, but you have to have be able to see faint reflections coming from, say, the Earth off of the moon back again, and that, that can be difficult. Uh, so generally during the new moon, we don't see anything. But then as we go around, the sun hits the moon at different angles, creating the phases that we see. And we can see that 
uh, as we go. We are waxing crescent. So waxing means we're getting bigger until we get to the full moon. Now you notice that the full moon, the dark side of the moon is really dark. It's not lit up. And the sun, which is here somewhere, I'll draw it around. I'll draw a sun around here just to make it make sense. The sun would be a big, a big object there. And so the sun, if the sun is here, it's shining on the moon and we can see the reflection of that back on earth. It's being reflected and we see the full moon. So then of course, as the moon continues its orbit, it starts to wane or get smaller and we get back to the new moon, okay? And then this cycle happens every month and we can predict it. You'll notice on the calendar, it often will tell you when the new moon is, when the first quarter is, when the full moon is, when the third quarter is, and so forth. You can see that all throughout the year, okay? Um, we can't see that there. That's a good one. Um, so we can see sort of here another way of looking at it. We can see the waxing and the waning. It's just uh, looked at differently, but this is a cycle. So once you get to the bottom, you go back to the top. Um, now, let's see here. Uh, I would do this in class normally. This is just talking about the synchronicity of the moon's orbit versus, so that would be the moon day versus the moon year, right? Those are the two types of rotation. And so, it's a synchronous, those two rotations are synchronous. The moon rotates exactly once with each orbit, and this is why only one side is visible from Earth. Now, eclipses, uh, I think we'll start there. We'll review a little bit for the next, uh, on the next lecture, and uh, we'll get there. Um, so this is a good place to stop, and I think it's enough information, even though we're, we're technically pretty early. Uh, but it's it's also a good time to ask questions and try and work out some issues. Um, so we'll we'll pick up here with a review of a lot of stuff we talked about last time, and we'll look here and we'll start to develop the, our idea of a scientific theory and our ideas of physics. Okay, and that's what we will be discussing uh, next time. Uh, so when we our discussion will be based off that uh, again on Thursday. For those of you who are here, I've got all 19 of you. I've goofed, and the days and the syllabus are wrong. We do meet Tuesday and Thursday, and I will be fixing the syllabus to reflect that uh, by today, if not today, tomorrow at the latest. Um, and I will hopefully have a link. Uh, I will have a link for you again by tomorrow afternoon at the latest of where to look at that next lecture, Thursday's lecture, so you can start. And again, I'll put up. I'll probably put up a bulk of them on YouTube uh, to figure that out. Uh, so that's what I've got for today. So are there any questions? Yes, um, we will do 11.30 to 12.45. Uh, that's when I'll sign on. So I'll be here at 11.30 on Thursday for our discussion part. And uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, so things we're gonna discuss on Thursday, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna assign those, um, those topics, we're gonna we're gonna do that, and we're gonna answer any questions that came up during lecture and discuss. Uh, I really want it to be more of a discussion than me talking, but there will be some of me talking. I saw a hand up. Who had a question? I don't know my YouTube channel name. I will I will do I will put that as an announcement on the Blackboard page. So when the when the channel name. Um, so on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we only started at nine fifteen today. Uh, I expect you to start at 9, so my expectation is that at 9.15 you will be watching things or doing things or at least before, right? 9.15 is the latest you should be watching the next lecture for that day. Uh, and again, this is all going to come pretty quick. It's a little weird because a lot of the responsibility shifts to you, right, to, to be sure you're caught up with those lectures. Um, uh, the homework, I like to think of the quizzes as homework, right? You should, when you're studying for the quiz, you really want to read the book first and sort of strategize on where you're going to find things when you're going through it. I do not recommend opening a quiz and trying to hunt while you do it. You'll run out of time uh, and it'll be too confusing. So you want to, you know, the idea of the quiz is that you read the book, the chapters, it'll, the quiz will tell you what chapters it covers. I have that in the instructions. And then you'll read those chapters, look at the lectures and sort of 
be able to strategize where to find information, and then you should be able to find it uh, and take the quiz. Okay. Um, so the slides, I won't keep there. You don't need the slides on Blackboard because you'll have um, recorded lectures that are the slides. So you have them. You can fast forward and pause to your heart's content. Uh, we'll, we will also have some activity reports, uh, Deborah. I should say that. I should say that too. We we will have those, but uh, I'll explain those a little bit in detail too. Uh, we're we're gonna have three reports we're gonna write, and they're not very long. They're just like a half page to a page about what you learned about um, for the activities. So um, yeah, the YouTube video should be posted tomorrow, or I should have that figured out by tomorrow. Uh, you'll know basically. You'll you'll know how to how to access that stuff by tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of have to figure it out. All right, you're welcome. Thank you, Professor. All right, no problem. Are we joining? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we're Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah, I'll just have stuff up tomorrow. So you can look tomorrow, but we're not joining a class tomorrow. Okay, and I, I, I just got an email from Samantha for the interpreters, if you're, if you're still here, um, and for, um, for Mary and Marie. Um, so apparently there is a way to do the captioning in Microsoft. Um, okay, so this is for existing materials you already have, please. Call. Okay, so I'll, I'll have to contact someone to do that. And we'll we'll do the best we can to get that uh, done as quickly as possible. Um, again, it, it, there might be some delay, but um, I'll, I'll, I'm working on it. Okay, I, I'm that email. I, I missed that email, which is weird because I was looking for it. Okay. Okay, no problem. All right. Um, Professor, this is yeah. Mary Jo, the interpreter speaking. If you can't get it ready soon. You can, uh, we can interpret the YouTube for this week, Thursday. Okay. We can, we'll need the link as well as the students and we can bring the link in with our Zoom account and then we'll okay. be able to interpret. All right. Okay, okay. sounds good. I'll send, I'll, I'll send you an email. Caption with Microsoft, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I, I just, like I said, I was looking for Samantha's email and was sort of surprised I didn't get it. And now I see she sent me one. Uh, and so that's good. And so now I, I have options. Uh, all right. Thank you, Great. Professor. Yep. No problem.
professor is class over for today? Uh, yeah, you're free, you're free to go if you want to go, but if you have any questions, uh, you know, stick around and feel free to ask them. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you Thursday. See you Thursday. Yeah, Paul. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, my question is about the quizzes. Which days are we going to take those quizzes? Or quizzes are online, and you'll have like a week to take it. So it's up to you when to take it. But once you take it, you will only have eighty minutes to take it. So you pick your right. time that works for you. The... Yeah, it's online. All right. All right. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to stop recording. Yeah, Stephen. So the assignment.